describe how you moved past the moments where you weren't recognized? Not, not recognized, but not respected. That was more of a motivator for me than, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me. It was more, look at what I've, what I've made. Look at what I've done. Show some respect, right? Hey there, Projector. Welcome to my humble kitchen here in Havana. And today's video all about legendary Linda Lundstrom, Canadian designer who happened to be my neighbor growing up and my mom's best friend. Uh, her husband, Joel, is also my dad's best friend. And then her two daughters, Moshe and Sophie, have been there with me throughout my life as I grew up. They are about 10 years younger than me. So today I want to share with you some footage from an interview I did with Linda where she really shares and illustrates what it is to be a 2-4 splenic projector. Hearing stories like I'm going to be sharing with you today is exactly how I have really learned human design experientially as a fourth line myself with the gift of listening and and helping open people up to sharing their stories i have learned about human design by really hearing people's stories and linda is an incredible character and storyteller so there's just so much gold in this interview. So today's video is going to highlight her story as well as projector recognition and the signature of success where she shares, I think, probably the best definition of success I've ever heard. So stay tuned for that at the end. Oh, and if we haven't met, I'm Karen McMullen, the Human Design Channel, and welcome to my channel. Let's jump in. I'm 70 years old. I'm, I'm making dinner. And I, I was grown up, I was brought up with this whole idea of waste not, want not. <laughs> so I can't, I can't waste anything. So the onion peels go in my stock pot. I'll make a stock out of those for, uh, for later, for soup or something. Anyway, I'm just getting, we're going to have hamburgers for dinner tonight. So I'm just, if you don't mind while we're talking, I'm just going to keep and creating. I was born in a little tiny little hamlet of about 30 people in the bush in northwestern Ontario. The nearest city was about a seven hour drive away. It was pretty isolated um, and I grew up, you know, in nature, making things work, being resourceful, hunting, fishing, picking berries, you know, living off the land and, and uh, putting everything in a big deep freeze. So we, you know, we ate moose meat, deer meat, pickerel, wild mushrooms, wild blueberries. So it was a very, I think I'm healthy as I am because I grew up on an organic, mostly organic diet, even though that's not what we called it back then. Our lifeline to the outside world was Eaton's catalog, which is a, you know, came twice a year and it was so exciting when it arrived. Anyway, my mother bought a, um, a Singer featherweight sewing machine, a little tiny sewing machine. And apparently I sat down at it when I was three years old and I started indicating that I wanted to sew. So my mom took the needle out and she let me, and it was an electric sewing machine, which was like state of the art back then. And uh, so I started, by the time I went to grade one, I was making my own clothes <laughs> to go to school. I never made doll clothes. I don't even remember having a doll actually. I, I wasn't into dolls. I was into like life size. So I started making things and my very first, um, one of my very first out, complete outfits was a like a pumpkin colored corduroy skirt, pencil skirt with a slit up the back. And um, actually, I think it was a sort of an off the shoulder top. <laughs> it's all coming back. Um, anyway, so I was making my own clothes for like my whole life. And then by the time I was 12 or 13, I was making clothes for other people. Bell bottom hipster pants for me and my girlfriends to go to a dance at the Polish Hall which was in the nearest big town, which was about 1,500 people. And yeah, so I, I spent my you know first 18 years of my life up there. Uh, once a year, we would go into Winnipeg, which was like 
oh my god, this big city with all these high buildings. And of course, Winnipeg is not a big city at all, but to us it was. That turned into that love of sewing. And my mother encouraged, that's the thing, my mother, I mean, she let me play with her sewing machine. She bought fabric for Meaton's catalog. Um, and we were brought up with this whole thing of waste not want not. So even the flower bags that the flower came in, that cotton was washed and she would make things out of it. What happened was I wasn't an academic student. I just wasn't interested. I was too busy making an outfit to wear to the exam, to study for the exam. So what happened was I went to, I studied fashion design at a community college and I became a fashion designer. And I started my own company when I was 23 years old after spending a year in Europe and a, a couple of years in Toronto in the garment district. I started my own company because I couldn't get a job. And when I got back from Europe, and um, that was Linda Lundstrom Limited. And I ran that company for 35 years. Started in a two bedroom apartment with a loan from my mom and dad and ended up being in a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility with 150 employees and stores all over North America carrying our product. We supplied boutiques in Canada and the US and a, and a few in Europe. I sold that company in 2008 and it was kind the industry was changing. Retail was like, who shops in retail stores anymore? And it was starting to happen back in 2008 and the online world was starting to develop and I just thought, mm, I gotta get out of this and took some time off. And now I am the designer for an online outerwear company called Thermacota, which I own with my two daughters. It was actually my daughter's idea to make glamorous, functional, romantic, warm, outerwear that keeps you warm and dry and doesn't make you look like you're on an arctic expedition. <laughs> so yeah, a fashion designer that grew up in northern, northern, remote Canada mining village. Quite a contradiction. She, she's so practical and bootstrappy. Now she actually has a TikTok that is over, I don't know how many subscribers at like a hundred and something thousand and um, sharing life hacks, Linda, you know, practical things that she does and every day. The story of the banker not giving me my loan. Well, there were several of those. I have several stories with bankers. The first one is that um, I went for a bank loan. Of, I think it was $5,000 when I was first starting. It was like nothing. And this uh, account manager uh, said, no problem, no problem, here's a sign. And by the way, if you could just give this to your father to sign. He wanted my dad to guarantee my loan. And I'd already been, been in business for a few years at that time. And what I was asking for was not a lot. So that was my first encounter with like crazy bankers. I had all kinds of issues. Uh, with bankers, but I also had some fabulous relationships with bankers when I was making a lot of money. <laughs> so when our company was really profitable and um, I mean, they, the banker invited me out for lunch to the top floor of the bank tower and everything. And, uh, but then when our margins were off, this is such a long story, Karen, but what happened was I started winning awards from the Chamber of Commerce. I was being given honorary doctorates, three, by the way. So I'm really glad I looked good for those exams. <laughs> and uh, I started winning awards and being recognized by the business community. And I, I know for sure that some of the bankers that I had crossed paths with in the past were probably in that audience, in those audiences. I don't actually remember one of them coming up to me at one of these uh, things and um, begging for forgiveness <laughs> or anything like that. But I kind of in the back of my mind felt vindicated to be recognized by the business community even when the banks uh, didn't really take me seriously. So like, you know, I'm, t I'm tall, I'm blonde. Back then I was pretty gorgeous and I just don't think they took me seriously. And my 
respect is really important to me. It's really important to me to give respect. It's really important. To, I don't care if people like me, but don't disrespect me. And I felt very disrespected on a number of occasions. And so I think by winning the awards and being recognized, I think hopefully it um, earned me some respect, finally. <laughs> how has, tell, tell us about recognition. Like how, how does it feel when you know that you're being recognized and someone really sees you? It has everything to do with respect. It's not as much about the recognition as it is about the respect. I, I just feel like I've been fighting my whole life. Well, I guess at a certain point I didn't have to fight for it anymore, but I feel like I was really trying to just get some respect. Rodney Dangerfield. I, I got no respect, right? He used, that was his line in his comment. Describe how you moved past the moments where you weren't recognized, where you were not seen. Not not recognized but not respected that was more of a motivator for me than oh look at me look at me look at me it was more look at what I've what I've made look at what I've done show some respect right I worked harder yeah if I felt that I wasn't getting respect I'm gonna show you look at watch this kind of thing that was my attitude I got I just got pissed off said, okay, I'm going to show you, <laughs> you know, does that make sense? Yeah, that's awesome. Is that a two? <laughs> that's a projector. It is? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, so no matter how many times I kept bringing up recognition, Linda insisted on replacing it with the word respect. You know, let me know in the comments if as a projector you resonate more with the word respect, but I did really enjoy how she approached it and also i just enjoyed the story that in the end she has been vindicated i guess um, by because her reality has been an undeniably successful life and that reminds me of amy elizabeth in the projector playlist series in the success video where she's saying you know you can't have success and bitterness you've got to choose and it's like, you're either bitter or you're successful. You can't be both. You can't be a bitter, successful person. <laughs> so you have to separate it and be like, well, if I choose bitterness, I'm really letting go of that success and I want the success. So I got to let go of the bitterness. To really choose to focus on where you're going and what you're doing and, and your unique signature. And I think Linda's saying something similar here. I love that time in the morning when you're not asleep but you're not fully awake and so your conscious mind isn't it isn't operating yet and you're not editing anything out but yet you're not asleep so you remember everything and it's it's i don't know there's probably a name for that state like a liminal oh really <laughs> a liminal well that that um I, that's when i get some really good ideas and I, I solve some problems and I it's like free it's, it's like there's no boundaries it's everything is just like kind of like up there and floating around I know it sounds weird but it, it, and I'm alone I mean even if my husband is beside me he might be asleep or he might be but I feel really in a uh, again almost like an altered state of consciousness when uh, and that's when I had my vision exactly that's, it was in that state when I had my vision for uh, a product that I made in my company. I was visited with the vision at that time, and it was a recurring, so it happened more than once. And I was compelled to make the, make the thing that I saw in my vision, and it ended up being a multi, multi-million dollar um, product and family of products for our company that really was the foundation of our success. It was called La Parca, and those Canadians, those of you who remember La Parca back in the 90s and the early 2000s, uh, you'll remember that there was, every schoolyard had a, a teacher on yard duty at recess in the win middle of winter wearing a La Parca. Wow. Because again, it was cold, it was warm, 
it was gorgeous and romantic looking and um, it was multifunctional and it just became a selling phenomenon. I was so blessed that I had that vision. Thank you. Awesome. When did you realize that you were unusually gifted or talented? I think it happened when people would say to me, how did you do that? <laughs> people would say, well, how did you do that? I'd go, I don't know, I just did it. Like, I think some of my competitors in the apparel industry would often say, I hear, they would say, the hell does she do that? I got a big kick out of that because I didn't know <laughs> how I did it. So for sure they didn't know how they did it. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm uh, false mo falsely modest or anything like that. But I seriously, um, I remember there was a time when um, there was a fashion show and we were doing a fashion show and I had, I had, and the fashion show was like in two days and everything had to be finished and accessorized and coordinated and assigned to a model and everything like that. And I had this idea for this coat that I really wanted to get into the show. And they're, fit, they're literally fitting the models and I'm there molding the fabric with my hands and cutting, making a pattern. And within two hours, I had a finished garment and I ran into the, where they were fitting the models and I said, look at this. And everyone went and they opened the show. It was the opening of the show called the envelope coat. It was simple, very, very simple, but it just had an architecture to it and a shape to it that was just, and it just came together like that. And the, and, and the, the people that were fitting the models said, how did you do that? <laughs> There was no coat two hours ago, and now there's a coat that's opening the show. So, um, what was your question? <laughs> how, how did you realize you were unusually gifted or talented? When people started, ask, yeah, that when people said, like, how the hell did you do that? In the human design lingo, that's called, like, the two is being called out. They don't actually see their gifts until someone recognizes it. It's kind of like the projector, but... Exactly. They don't realize it themselves. They're just totally, or I'm just totally so immersed in what I'm doing that, yeah. But it would even be, I would read like Fortune magazine, a business magazine, right? This and it'd be Joel. this real interesting business article about some latest management trend. And I would tell Linda about it. And then a week or two later, we'd be at a meeting or something, and Linda would start talking about it, but she had I never read the article. put a spin on it that was different. The, the, the theme was there, but she put a little spin on it that worked for our company. Do you know what I mean? I, it just was like unbelievable to me that she had somehow done that without reading the article and had somehow put it so that it, it really worked for her situation. Another amazing thing that I want to point out about Linda that she does really naturally is she believes in herself and her ideas and her own resourcefulness and her own ability to know what to do and she follows her own guidance. So, you know, she had the vision but she executed it. Uh, she took in Joel's article that he read and then she reinterpreted it and she implemented it in her way and so I think that's such a beautiful demonstration of what's possible for projectors when they really believe in themselves and they value their own way of seeing and being in the world. Okay so the projector is here to in their signature become successful or be successful, projector success. Right, but how do you measure that success? That was the question I was going to ask you. Oh, okay. <laughs> because success can be measured in many ways, right? Success can be measured in profits, bottom line. Success can be measured in how much fun something is. I have to tell you that there, I get a thing in my body that is my 
it's like a it's like a physical thing. It's a, what do you call that physical? It's like a sensation. It's a physical feeling that I have that is my indicator of success. It can happen when there's absolutely no monetary impact to this success, but it's a chill that goes through me. I get a, I, I have a visceral reaction when I feel like something is a success and it's unmistakable and and when I'm when I'm feeling the opposite of that which is something that I'm feeling I'm not successful it's a very heavy a lot of effort a lot of obstacles a lot of there's no flow and when I have that feeling of uh, that tingly sensation I feel it in my body it feels very light. It feels like I'm being lifted up. I get a sh I, and I get a shiver. Whenever that happens, you know, I could be down to my last dollar in the bank, but when that happens, I feel that success. Does that make sense? So it's not. I love being financially secure. I love making. I love being profitable because I feel if you're making something and nobody's buying it, how successful are you? But if if you're making something that gives you that tingling sensation and people are buying it and they're getting a tingly sensation from it, that's success. If it ends up being going to the bottom line, which is being profitable and financially successful, that's just a byproduct. It's not a it's not essential. It often happens, but it's not essential in order for something to feel like success. Thank you so much. That's Thanks a, for that question, because I never even thought about that before. That's the best answer. It's really? So good. So good. Yeah. I feel like Linda is demonstrating through her story just how much she is her. She's really herself. She is 100% Linda Lundstrom, you know, from the time of loving the sewing machine and valuing doing and being with her hands and having a natural ability as a 2-4 and, and just being her. And that as she was her, eventually, you know, that received the recognition. So I really hope that you receive this inspiration that Linda is exemplifying just to be yourself and do you and how that does lead to recognition and the signature of success in time. So I know you love Linda by now, so we're gonna hear from her again about her incredible story about burnout and bitterness and how she has handled that as well as more of the footage about her as a 2-4 profile. As always, I'm here for you if you would like my interpretation of your human design chart. I'll put the link to my readings there. And also you can check out my offerings to help emissaries of light or energetically aware people to really get their work out into the world in a way that thrives. See you again soon.